In today's video, I'll be diving into the, one of the most crucial yet often overlooked aspects of 3D printing, infill. Whether you're a beginner or an experienced maker, understanding infill is the key to optimizing your prints for strength, weight, and efficiency. We'll cover the different types of infill patterns, how to choose the right density, and some tips to help get the best results for your prints. Now, before we get started, I'd like to thank PCB Way for sponsoring this video. PCB Way not only offers high quality PCBs and assemblies, they also offer a wide range of maker services like CNC machining and 3D printing with access to extraordinary materials. Visit them on the web and check out the PCB Way 7th Project Design Contest. PCB Prototype the Easy Way. Okay, so looking at the infill settings, the first one we have is the infill density. Uh, it's set at 15%. Obviously, you can change that to whatever you want. Just want to make sure you're giving yourself enough to support the layer above it. So, when you come up here, bring it down right there. This is the layer that you're actually trying to support. This is your first top layer. And it's indicated as an internal bridge. You can turn it on or off. Now, we're getting plenty of support there. Plenty of contact point. And that's what you want to look for, the contact point. Uh, moving on, the next one is the AI infill. I'm going to go ahead and we'll check that box and change this density to 20 because I don't get any results with anything but tw below 20. And what that does is it adds more infill to the outer edges uh, closer to your outside walls and leaves bigger gaps in the middle. It only works with grid and rectilinear. Like I said, anything below 20% I haven't had success with. Back. Uh, next, we're going to our infill pattern. And reality gives us 23 different patterns. I will go through those a little bit later in this video. All right, so next up is our sparse infill anchor length and our maximum length of the infill anchor. Uh, this refers to how it attaches to the side of the inside wall of your model. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm changing the maximum length of the infill anchor to zero. We'll re-slice. And there you can see it's just butting up against each other. No big deal there. Uh, let's reset that back. I'm going to change my infill density to 5% just to spread it out a little bit. And I'm going to change the infill anchor length to one millimeter. And we'll re-slice. And there you can see how we have these tiny little legs. It's no longer stretched across. Each one of these legs is no more than one millimeter. If I changed it to five and re-slice, you can see how they're a little longer. So that's what that refers to. All right, next up is the internal solid infill pattern. Now it's currently set to monotonic and this refers to the layers above your infill. So it's actually the purple layers. What you have is a blue layer, which is your bridge. If I can get it set there, that's nice right there. That is our bridge. And then we're going to go up and when we hit the purple, that is what it's referring to as the internal in solid infill pattern. Let's change that to something crazy like uh, concentric and re-slice. And now you can see what it did. This gave us a concentric pattern. Now that did not affect our internal bridge. Back down through. There's our internal bridge, just like it was before. Now we're coming up to our internal solid infill. I have five layers total, so we should have one more of those. And we'll be on the final top layer, which it does not affect. So what you want to do is pick something that's going to support your top layer best. Okay, next up is the apply fill, gap fill, and filter out tiny gaps. We're going to work those two together. And basically what that does is areas that are tiny and can be filled, like this little white line. You can turn the gap infill on and off over here on the side. You can see where it actually applied it. Um... It just fills in those holes. It's by default set to everywhere. Your options are top and bottom surfaces or nowhere. Top and bottom surfaces, like it says, it's only going to be top and bottom surfaces. If you have it everywhere, that means 
internally it'll do that as well, which is what I want. If I got tiny gaps, I want them filled. Now, this filter out tiny gaps. That is a limit. So I'm going to set this to two. That means anything smaller or anything larger than two millimeters is not going to be filtered out. Let's go ahead and reslice. And there you can see it did not fill in our little gap. So change that back and you'll be back to having your tiny gaps. Oh. All right. So the next one we're going to look at is our infill and wall overlap. And this is based on a percentage of the wall thickness, the infill wall thickness. And when you zoom in real tight, you'll notice that the red infill is inside of the yellow outer wall. Uh, that's at 30%, and I almost always leave it there. I don't have a uh, reason to change it much. I'm going to change it to negative 30 for now. And that was just to demonstrate what it does. You can see right now we have a gap between the red infill and the yellow outer wall. If you put it on to 0%, they should just butt up against each other. But you get a much stronger print if you have that embedded into that wall somewhat. All right, so I'm going to take a quick look at some of the other settings here in the advanced. Not all of them, but the more important ones. Like the sparse infill direction, currently set at 45 degrees, as you can see. Uh, I'm using a line rectilinear just to make it more visible on what's going on here. I'm going to go ahead and change that to zero and reslice. And you can see what it did with the direction. Let's reset that. And now I'm going to go ahead and change my solid infill direction from 45 to zero. And let's reslice. Now we're not seeing anything yet because remember the solid infill will be the purple. And you'll notice what it did up here. See how it's going straight up and down on the print. And it does alternate direction 90 degrees. But that's about it. So I'm going to change that back to 45. Um, next one I'm going to change is the rotate solid infill direction. Again, reslice solid infill being the top purple layers. Now you can see our very first one here. Look at the direction. And then we are going to come down one more layer. Try to. You'll notice that all of our top layers, they don't alternate direction. They're all the same direction. Um, not a fan of that myself, but maybe somebody has a use for it. I just figure you get more coverage by having it rotate. So I leave that alone. The infill bridge direction. Now, this one never did anything. This here is your internal bridge, the blue, as you can tell over here actually toggle that on and off but changing that to any direction it, it just it's never made a difference for me it never had any control over it it's 180 degrees it's the same direction uh, i'm going to change it to 90 or reslice and it's the same direction so i've never really gotten that to change by any setting now changing uh the infill direction does change this. It tries to keep it perpendicular as much as it can. Because what you want to do is get as much coverage or as many contact points as you can. And it, that's what the, the secret to infill is, is. How much contact can you make with your infill on this layer here? This builds the infill being your foundation and this being basically considered your subfloor. How sturdy can you make that? And your layers above that, will look, if this looks good, they're even going to look better. All right, so let's go ahead and I'm going to go through all of infill patterns. What prints fast, what prints slow, how much it uses them. Okay, so on my screen, what you've been seeing is a 50 millimeter cube. 50 in X, 50 in Y, 50 in Z. I'm using two wall loops, five top layers, three bottom layers, and 15% infill. And I'm going to run through all of the infill patterns that Creality Print offers. And we'll take a look at how they print, what they look like, where they're good uh, for use, how much material they use, things along that line. Let's take a quick look at it. Uh, this is concentric. It pretty much follows the perimeter of your model. It doesn't offer a whole lot of support. And if you're not careful, you're not going to get 
good contact surface on your top first top layer. This is rectilinear. It looks much like the grid, but when you zoom in, what you'll notice is that it alternates every other layer. It does not intersect. You're not going to get an accumulation of material. It does offer strength in all directions. It's strong and it prints at a decent. This is the grid infill. It crosses at every single layer. You'll get an accumulation at each one of these points of material, and you'll hear your nozzle rubbing across it, and you risk the chance of knocking your model over. However, it does print fast, and it is strong. This is the line infill, and like rectilinear, it does not intersect on the same layer. It alternates. It will not get the accumulation of material. The pattern's kind of strange looking, but it does offer a good amount of strength. Uh, it prints reasonably fast and it is pretty strong. Cubic infill pretty much builds up a bunch of little air pockets all the way out throughout your model. So if you're looking for something as an insulator uh, to keep a cold drink cold, maybe you're building a little koozie. Or if you want buoyancy to a print, this would be a good one for that. But it does intersect at each layer, multiple points, and you do run the risk of the nozzle touching the this is the triangle infill. You can see where it gets its pattern from or the name from. Uh, it does intersect at each layer, so you got to be careful of an accumulation of material. It doesn't print real fast, and it does use a decent amount of material. It's not the worst one out there. This one is called trihexagon. See where it gets its name from. It makes a series of triangles and hexagons. It prints pretty fast, and it doesn't use a lot of material. It offers a lot of strength in all directions. This is a pretty good choice. This is gyroid. This one is my choice of uh, infill. Uh, it offers strength in all directions. It does print slow compared to a lot of others, and it does use a little more material, but it is strong. This is honeycomb. It prints really slow. Does not intersect at the same layer. Uh, it does butt up against each other. Series of honeycomb patterns. Uh, it uses a lot of material, but it is strong. This one here is called adaptive cubic. It's pretty cool. Um, it starts and ends with a tight pattern, but in the middle, it makes wide open voids, and it makes more adds more strength around the sides, keeps the middle open. Uh, because of this, it doesn't print real slow, and it doesn't use a whole lot of material. Next up is the line rectilinear. Uh, it prints pretty fast. It doesn't use a lot of material. If you're going to use this one, just make sure you check the preview to make sure that your first top layer is perpendicular to the pattern. You don't want them falling in between the gaps, so you're going to want to make sure it's perpendicular. You have plenty of contact points. Okay, this one here is 3D Honeycomb. Much like Gyroid, it offers a lot of strength in all directions, but also like Gyroid, it prints slow and it does use a lot of material. Next up is the Hilbert Curve. It does print slow. It's kind of a weird maze-like pattern. Uh, I see more problems with this as an infill. Probably just meant for something decorative as a top surface, like a, a model where you have zero top layers. Like a coaster. This one is called Archimedean Cords. Um, in general, I don't use it, but if you're printing something with a flexible material like TPU and you wanted to add some more springiness to it, right there is a perfect filament for that. It's actually spring shaped, as a matter of fact. That would be good for something flexible. This one is called Octogram Spiral. Um, this is another one I'm not a big fan of. Doesn't seem to offer a lot of strength. Maybe I just didn't give it enough of a chance. It prints slow, uses a lot of material, and again, this would be a great decorative uh, top surface for a coaster or something along those lines. If you got a better idea, let me know in the comments. This is called Support Cubic, and what it does is starts off with a big, large gap at the bottom that builds up as you get towards the top of your model starts to fill in. This one actually looks pretty cool and because of the way it's structured, it doesn't take a lot of time to print and it doesn't use a lot of material. This is lightning infill and what it does 
it leaves most of your model hollow until you get to an area where you're going to have a top surface. And then it starts building from the walls inward. And that adds you adds your support for the top layer. This is great if you have like a figurine, a, a bust of something, something like that. It It's great for that. So that's just going to sit on a shelf. If you're looking for strength, this is not the one to go for. This one is called Crosshatch. Uh, I do like this one. It reminds me a lot of Gyroid. It does not intersect at each layer. Um, it does print a little bit faster than Gyroid, and it does use a little less material. It does offer strength in all directions. So I want to compare this a little bit with the Gyroid over my next few prints. and I might be making a switch over to this. This one is called Cross. It looks cool, but that's about it. It doesn't offer a lot of strength. It doesn't give you enough uh, points of contact to support your first top layer. Print slow. It uses a lot of material. I'm not a fan of this. Now this one is called Cross 3D, and it's pretty much just like the Cross, except that the 3D a 3D pattern. But you're still left with these big, big gaps where your material can fall through. And again, it prints slow, uses a lot of material, but it does look cool. This one is called Quarter Cubic. It does offer a lot of strength in all directions. The drawback is that it prints slow, uses a lot of material, and it does intersect at every layer. And again, that means you can risk rubbing your nozzle across the infill and knock your model over. All right, so this one here is called tetraheteral. And it's just a series of pockets that, well, it would make a great insulator. It offers strength in all directions. Um, a lot of air. It's going to give you good buoyancy if you're trying to build yourself something floatable. The downside is it prints slow and uses a lot of material. In this case, I would probably still be going for the gyroid. And last but not least is PPMS D cell. I don't know what the name refers to, but much like gyroid, uh, it alternates directions, does not cross on the same path. Kind of weird looking. But it offers strength in all directions. It does print pretty fast, and it use, doesn't use a whole lot of material. This is another good choice. Let's take a look at how long it took to print and how much material each infill type used. Now, the longest to print was Honeycomb at 1 hour and 7 minutes using 40.84 grams of material, which was also the most amount of filament used. Gyroid came in fourth longest behind quarter cubic and tetraheteral. Now, it was no surprise to see Lightning infill coming in at the fastest to print at 22 minutes 25 seconds and only using 15.68 grams. Of now experiment around with the different patterns, different settings, see which one works best for your models. Remember the name of the game is building a good foundation to get a better top surface. I hope you found this information useful. If you did, hit that like button and let me know down in the comments. Smash that bell so you'll be alerted to new content in the future. Live your life one layer at a time, and if you haven't done it yet, please consider subscribing.